and you're live. Welcome, everybody. Uh, so I can't tell how many people, should we, should we give a few minutes or just jump right in? Let's give a few minutes or a minute because we all know how often it takes to jump between different um, sessions. So we'll just give a, a minute for everybody to join. So we'll be starting very shortly. Excellent, welcome everybody. And good morning, afternoon or evening, depending on where you are located. And wherever you are, we are thrilled that you have joined our session, which I, I am sure you will find will be thought provoking and highly relevant for thinking about the holistic approaches we need to prevent global health threats, such as the one we are currently facing with COVID-19. I am Dr. Elizabeth Dowd, and it is my pleasure to moderate this session where we're going to dive into preventing zoonotic spillover at its source. I am a natural resources officer in the at the biodiversity division here at USAID. And my training is as a wildlife veterinarian and conservation scientist. I have worked at the nexus of human, animal, and ecosystem health for most of my career. And I'm honored to continue to do so through the uh, USAID's One Health uh, Working Group. So let me just advance. <laughs> there we go. So for um, the next 85 minutes or so, we have the opportunity to learn from and, and actually engage with seven esteemed colleagues spanning three continents who are really striving to better understand the linkages across the One Health triad. And, and their disciplines are, are quite diverse and really represent what is needed to tackle today's global health challenges. And, and those include human medicine, veterinary medicine, disease ecology, economics, invasion ecology, biodiversity conservation, and science policy. But what really unites this group is their recognition that a healthy ecosystem is critical to maintain human health and global health security. So we, we've designed our panel to maximize your engagement. So we, we recognize that some of the material presented may be new. So we want to allow a lot of time for discussion uh, to hear and answer your questions. Each panelist will present a flash talk between about three to five minutes to introduce key concepts. And we have three great uh, case studies, which are really interesting, you'll enjoy. And I will introduce each panelist right before they give their talk. And then after the presentations, uh, we will have a short Jamboard session where we will ask for your written responses to this question. How can we better integrate ecosystem health into the global health security agenda? Now, Jamboard is a, is a really easy uh, interactive platform, so be ready to share. And uh, don't worry, it, it is easy. As I said, uh, I will provide the Jamboard link along with the question when we're ready for it. And then at the end, we're going to consolidate your responses and share those back to you, the, the main themes. And then the rest of the session is going to be Q&A. So please stick around. Uh, I, I suspect this is going to be a lively discussion. So before we hear from our first expert, 
uh, who's disappearing in, into the space. Um, thank you, Jonathan. Uh, but I, I just want to take a moment to thank the conference of um, organizers. They've done a really great job, and particularly Winnie, who is providing technical support uh, for our session. So uh, let's get started. So it is my privilege to introduce our first panelist, Dr. Jonathan Potts. Dr. Potts is professor and director of the Global Health Institute at the University of Wisconsin at Madison. He co-chaired the health report for the first congressionally mandated US national assessment on climate change and for 15 years served as a lead author for the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change or IPCC. Professor Potts has worked on global environmental health for over two decades and is an elected member of the National Academy of Medicine. Over to you, Jonathan. Thank you, Elizabeth. It's a pleasure to be here and present uh, to this distinguished group at the USAID. Uh, so I'm gonna dive straight into the global health security agenda and ask the first question, you know, what, what have we learned from this current COVID-19 pandemic? Um, and I would say the biggest thing is primarily how essential it is to avoid another pandemic as best that we can. So the global health security agenda's vision is for a world safe and secure from global health threats posed by infectious diseases. And USAID plays a critical role in coordinating the US government's global health security efforts uh, through efforts uh, lined up with, for example, prevent, detect, and respond uh, in addressing infectious diseases, uh, both threats at home and abroad. And USAID's global health security program even pursues a one health approach that recognizes that the future of uh, well-being of humans, animals, and the environment are inextricably linked, including projects uh, in partner countries that strengthen capacity to address the risk posed by zoonotic diseases that spill over from animals into humans, which cause epidemics and pandemics. But, you know, there remains a major gap in the global health security agenda, even the very strategic approach that USAID is taking to adequately look at some of the earliest causal factors of disease emergence and resurgence. And by not fully investing in studying these earliest first dominoes, for example, thinking of a domino effect and causal pathway of disease, um, the, the first uh, issue may really deal with disruption of nature or landscape related imbalances of species that may carry deadly diseases. And if we don't adequately look at these earliest factors, we will not adequately be confronting the root causes. And when we consider that about half of the planet's surface has already been altered by human activity, the health risks from land use change that disrupt natural habitats should be included as a priority prevention focus of the global health security agenda. Uh, Elizabeth, next slide, please. So we will in this panel show several examples of how unhealthy landscapes contribute to the risk of several infectious diseases, uh, including some that are close to SARS-CoV-2 that's causing the, the COVID-19 pandemic. I'll start now by showing one of our own studies that links deforestation in the Amazon to the risk of malaria. Now this map shows various types of forest disturbance in the Amazon basin. Over several decades, we've seen uh, disruption from roads, fires, logging, 
And what we did in our study was we, uh, after controlling for human population density, we asked the question, what's the relationship between malaria risk and land use, land use uh, disruption? And we found that the abundance measured by the biting rate of the primary malaria mosquito, the malaria carrying mosquito in that region is the Anopheles darlingi species. And we found that there was a very strong relationship between that the abundance and the biting rate of the species and the extent of deforestation after controlling for human population. So we found biting rates uh, and also larval abundance strongly correlated with deforestation. Biting rates were somewhere in the neighborhood of 270 times more in, in the most deforested areas uh, after controlling for human population. So quite significant. And in, in summary, that for every 1% of deforestation, the incidence rate or new cases of malaria increased by 11%. So um, this is just one you know, first case study and we'll be seeing more. You'll, you'll hear more examples of why the global health security agenda goal of disease prevention must address, um, assess and address root causes of disease emergence. And this means far more attention to land use as a primary driver of zoonotic disease outbreaks. Evidence over the past couple of decades already shows that protecting nature protects human health. Thank you and Elizabeth, on to our next panelist. Wonderful, thank you very much, Jonathan. That really sets us up um, very nicely for keeping a kind of a high level overview and um, context with the global health security agenda. So I'm, I'm pleased to introduce our next speaker who will give more details about um, the, the land use induced spillover. And she is Dr. Raina Plowright. Dr. Plowright is an associate professor of epidemiology at Montana State University with a background in ecology, epidemiology, and veterinary medicine. She investigates the dynamics of disease systems that connect animal and human populations through transdisciplinary research. Her group focuses on World Health Organization priority pathogens that have emerged from bats into humans. And she leads a quote, collaboration of scientists working to predict and prevent zoonotic spillover called Bat One Health. Raina, over to you. Thanks, Elizabeth. I'm going to talk about how pandemics start, how they're triggered, and also give a, a 101 on this concept of land use induced spillover. So first, all pandemics start with an infected reservoir host on a landscape. And we often forget that concept, but we have uh, that reservoir host. The reservoir host is the animal that naturally maintains the pathogen within its populations. But a pandemic also then requires that animal has to shed or excrete the pathogen. There has to be a spillover event to a new host species, and then there has to be spread amongst that new host species. And land use change might be the most important trigger for this entire cascade. Next slide. So microbes, uh, we call them microbes when they're circulating in animal populations and not causing disease. When they're in humans and causing disease or in any species and causing disease, we call them pathogens. And so pathogens or microbes that can cross species into humans, we call them zoonotic pathogens. I'm gonna call them pathogens from now on. So these zoonotic pathogens usually have an ancient relationship with their reservoir host species. So they've circulated for millennia within their populations and often do, do not, not causing disease. They have fluctuations that are very dynamic in space and time. We'll see upticks of, of pathogen. We'll see troughs of pathogen, just like we see with SARS-CoV-2 in the current pandemic, where we'll see some communities with high levels of disease and some communities with low levels of disease. We have those same natural dynamics going on in animal populations at all times. 
<laughs> but certain stresses, abiotic or biotic, can change the relationship between animals and their pathogens, causing um, the surges of pathogen infection. For example, uh, food shortages, um, the crowding of animals around limited resources are two factors that could cause changes in the um, amount of infection in, in these populations. Next slide. To be able to have the spillover event from the reservoir host to, to humans and other species, that pathogen has got to be able to get out of the host, exit the host. And usually the mode in which that pathogen exits the host or is released determines the mode of transmission to the next host. So for example, if a vector bites the animal reservoir and then bites a person, that's a vector-borne uh, disease, vector-borne route of transmission. If the pathogen is shed or excreted in urine or feces, then we often get a more direct route of transmission. It could be, a, for example, respiratory or foodborne. And there are other methods such as slaughter, where, which release the pathogen from wildlife and especially into humans. Next slide. The next stage is spillover, and this is the actual jumping of the species barrier. So spillover requires that the human, or sometimes it's a, an intermediate a reservoir, of intermediate host, has contact with the reservoir host or direct contact with the pathogen, for example, through excreta. The, the recipient host, the human or, or, or intermediate host, has to receive enough pathogen to become infected, so a sufficient dose. And that pathogen has to be compatible with that with that new host. Next slide. And then the final stage of the pandemic, uh, the pathogen has to be able to spread within the new population. So within humans, for example, it's going to be able to go human to human and spread from human to human uh, community. Next slide. We can arrest the pandemic in the early stages if we pay attention to these three concepts. Firstly, landscape immunity. These are the conditions that prevent those high levels of infection I talked about. So reducing the, the abiotic and biotic stresses as an example of keeping um, pathogens in check within their animal communities. We can reduce wildlife human proximity. So that is reducing the contact that's necessary for that spillover process. For example, stop fragmenting intact habitats, reduce our road building that bring people into wildlife habitat. And, and finally, ecological countermeasures. These are targeted landscape-based interventions that are designed to arrest this process before it starts. Thank you. Excellent, thank you, Raina. Uh, Excellent explanation and review of this process. So we're now going to uh, share another of uh, these really interesting PACE studies from Dr. Susana Sokolo. So Do Dr. Sokolo is a senior scientist at Stanford's Woods Institute for the Environment and the Marine Science Institute at the University of California, Santa Barbara. With a background in veterinary medicine and ecology, she works at the intersection of health and sustainability sciences. She is co-founder and executive director of Stanford's program for disease ecology, health, and the environment. Sana, over to you. Thanks, Elizabeth. Great to be here. So um, lurking beneath the surface of of the calm waters here on the shore of the Senegal River in West Africa are tiny snails carrying the human parasite called schistosomiasis. And um, where I've been working for about 10 years. And unfortunately, um, villages along this, this river system, uh, the kids there experience very high levels of this parasite greater than 90% prevalences in some cases. Next slide. And this wasn't always the case. This is the Diyama Dam that you can see here that was built near the mouth of the Senegal River in 1986. In the upper right, you can see that before 1986, infection rates with the parasite were quite low. Next slide. So what happened? Well, here you can see the view from space. On the left, before the dam uh, of this basin and on the right, after the dam, and you can see the dam as the thick black line. 
And you can see from space this massive landscape transformation that followed construction of the dam it happened pretty rapidly within a few years. In short, the dam led to more water, more vegetation, and an explosion of the snails that carry the parasite. Next slide. What you cannot see from space is this guy, a large migratory species of freshwater prawn. It does require brackish water for part of its life cycle, and so used to migrate up and down hundreds of miles up and down this river. Next slide until the dam was built, in which case afterward, it was basically extirpated from all the upstream reaches of the dam. And this is very important because this prawn is a voracious predator of the snails that carry the parasite. Next slide. So what to do about it? Um, a little more than five years ago, um, we started to think, well, why not bring the prawns back? Um, reintroduce the prawns coupled with treatment of kids with the uh, drug to treat their existing worms, we thought would be an effective strategy because it essentially targets both arms of the transmission cycle in people and in their source in the environment. So we did just that, next slide. So with partners from 10 countries, four continents, we formed this project called the Upstream Alliance, which partnered together to reintroduce prawns and study their effects. And uh, we found in a demonstration site where we reintroduced prawns and treated kids that there was about an 80% reduction in snails and a 50% reduction in, in parasite infection levels in the kids compared to a control demonstration site where we use drugs alone to treat the kids. Uh, next slide. So what does this prawn story mean for us going forward? Um, about mid-century, we expect a little less than 10 billion people. And of course that means a massive scale up of transforming land for agriculture, including dams, to support food security and nutrition. Next slide. And the open question, you know, the big open question I think that remains is what are going to be the effects of this, this massive landscape transformation on human disease? And even more importantly, what are exactly those ecological countermeasures like the prawn reintroductions that we might devise to protect human health? Excellent. Thank you very much, Sana. So we go from schistosomiasis in Senegal to now the Galapagos Islands, Ecuador, to hear another case study from Dr. Carl Campbell. Dr. Campbell is one of the world's experts in island conservation. As the Island Conservation's Regional Executive Director for Latin America, he combines his scientific and management expertise to design and implement large scale island conservation projects, which can provide both ecological and human health benefits. Carl, over to you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, thanks everyone for being here. Um, so our invasive species case study takes us to Floriana Island in the Galapagos Islands, where I'm based. When you think of the Galapagos, you're probably thinking about the tortoise on the left. But there's another reality that plays out daily in the Galapagos. On Floriana Island, there are 140 residents with their pets, livestock, uh, including chickens, pigs and cattle, and a heavy reliance on agriculture um, and visiting uh, tourists. They grow yucca, maize, fruits and vegetables. But Floriana also has unique species found nowhere else in the world, like Darwin's medium tree finch, which is critically endangered and endemic to Floriana Island. And it has invasive species, introduced and outside their native range, like black rats, 80s Egyptoid mosquitoes, and the diseases that these two carry are also considered invasive species. I'll be focusing here a little bit more on invasive rodents. Next slide, please. Floriana, like 80% of the islands globally, is plagued by invasive rodents. Invasive rats and mice negatively impact livelihoods through impacts on agricultural production and food security. We see pre-harvest losses of around 40% occurring annually, even with control. Rats also contaminate water and impact, impact ecosystem services. And invasive rodents are commensal. They're in people's homes. 
They spoil food stored for people and their animals with feces and urine. Invasive rodents are also key disease vectors impacting human and domestic animal health. As introduced novel additions to ecosystems that are frequently in close proximity to people, they facilitate novel interactions and pathways for zoonotic, zoonotic disease. Invasive rodents are omnivorous and they cause major declines and local extinctions of natal, native wildlife upon which they prey. But they're also altering forest structure and composition through seed and seedling predation. Thus, they're a major stressor for native fauna and flora. During the dry season, rodents start dying of starvation and many move into farmer's fields and near housing where they're attempting to secure food. As they're highly stressed and at high concentrations, they're also more likely to be shedding disease. Next slide, please. Florian is just one example of what is playing out daily on the world's 450,000 odd islands. These islands are also home to 11% of the world's population. However, on islands, we can permanently eradicate invasive species like rats which are being eradicated actually on more than 600 islands globally. We know that when invasive species are eradicated, that the ecosystems recover. Increasing ecosystem resilience, immunity, and reducing the risk of zoonotic disease. I work for island conservation, and we've been working with the Floriana community to establish infrastructure for livestock needed for the sustainable agricultural practices that'll facilitate a series of wildlife reintroductions. It'll also facilitate the eradication of invasive rodents. And the community has requested our help in eradicating invasive rodents. And this work is scheduled for 2023, funding dependent. I suggest here that islands present an opportunity for funders interested in sustainable development and in preventing zoonotic uh, spillover through the eradication of invasive species as potential disease vectors. Of the thousand plus invasive mammal eradications that have occurred to date, I know of none that have been done actually to prevent uh, specific disease risks to people. Thanks very much. Back to you, Elizabeth. Excellent. Thank you very much, Carl. Really interesting um, case story. And now we're going to jump to another continent in India, where we will hear from Dr. Abhi Vanek. Dr. Vanek is a senior fellow and convener of the Center for Biodiversity and Conservation at the Ashoka Trust for Research in Ecology and the Environment in Bangalore. He is the lead author of the One Health and Zoonoses uh, program in India's proposed national mission on biodiversity and human well being. Avi, over to you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, so, when we look at the global burden of uh, emerging infectious diseases, there's three broad patterns that, uh, that are easily visible. So, one is high human density. Uh, along with the attendant livestock that, that, that humans uh, keep close to us and regions of high biodiversity. When these three come, come together, that often leads to an increase in the risk of pathogen emergence. If you look at a global map of where this is, where these hotspots are, they tend to be in, more, in the tropical regions of the world. And this is also where um, some of the poorest people live and therefore the burden of infectious diseases tends to be highest in these uh, in these poorer communities which are often close to forest uh, or these forest ecosystems and whose livelihoods may in fact may therefore be closely uh, dependent on accessing benefits from these forest areas next slide please 
An example of a lesser known uh, disease is, is the Kyasunul forest disease, which is found in the biodiversity hotspot of the Western Ghats of Southern India. Now this was, this is a fairly obscure disease. It's a tick bone, uh, tick bone virus. So uh, similar in some sense to Lyme disease. And it has a complex cycle, which involves, you know, multiple stages of the ticks life cycle itself, uh, but also a whole host of other uh, small vertebrates, including small mammals, birds, uh, medium-sized mammals, so small mammals such as rodents and shrews, medium-sized mammals such as uh, monkeys, and larger mammals such as um, livestock or deer. And monkeys are, are thought to be an amplifying host or a sentinel host for this disease. But occasionally, a, uh, the disease spills over via the bite of the ticks to humans. And every year, between 500 to 1,000 people get affected by this. And this can, this can cause a fairly severe debilitating hemorrhagic um, uh, illness at, at its worst. Uh, and people do die from this from from this disease every year. Uh, what are the next slide, please? Um, so we try to try and understand what are the factors that may that may result in in people getting exposed to these diseases. So we looked at all the um, uh, risk and ha uh, risk factors. So they included understanding the disease itself, its ecology, um, in terms of the interactions it has with its host, uh, with the vector and the various hosts. And uh, what are the ecological factors and environmental factors that may lead to increased risk for people? The other thing we want to look at is how do, how do people's behavior uh, impact their risk or change their own risk? Because these are lived landscapes. These are not remote forest stages. These places have had people residing in them for uh, hundreds of years. But there have been uh, rapid changes in the landscape over the last uh, 20, 30 years, which has caused a spread, a geographic, an increase in the ge geographic spread uh, of this disease into newer regions. Uh, so we wanted to try and understand what are these factors that come together to increase the, the risk of this, of this disease emerging into people. Next slide, please. So we try to understand factors such as landscape fragmentation, the increase of plantations in, uh, in forest landscapes, uh, forest loss over, over time, uh, the amount of the number of cattle or livestock that people, uh, people keep with them, like human density, socioeconomic conditions and so forth. And then we put these together in a predictive model uh, to try and understand uh, which area, so basically try and build a spatial risk map for KFD. And what we found was that uh, this model worked fairly well in predicting areas of increased risk for KFD um, in the next season. So therefore we were then able to use this uh, as a spatial decision support tool and present it to, uh, to, the, to the managers so that they could go and, and uh, implement measures to mitigate the risk of this, of this disease, including uh, you know, informing people about how to prevent tick bites, uh, uh, increase vaccination in some of these areas and so forth. And all of this was possible because we had a very large interdisciplinary team of people come together that included uh, veterinarians, public health specialists, social scientists, ecologists, and workers on the field. So, my take home message is that to do, to do this kind of work, to do proper One Health work, we really need large groups of interdisciplinary scientists coming together. Thank you. Uh, excellent, really interesting, Abhi. Uh, interesting use of uh, landscape ecology and disease ecology, integrating those in um, you know, predictive modeling. So now we're shifting gears and we're going to hear um, from someone who's gonna bring us back down to reality 
our, uh, our, the economist and our team. And I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Gunnar Palatais. Dr. Palatais is a senior fellow at the Sustainability Innovation Lab at Colorado and an instructor at the Mortensen Center in Global Engineering and the Masters of the Environment program, both at University of Colorado Boulder. Gunnar's focuses on biodiversity conservation, environmental and natural resource economics, and environmental risk management in the Global South. Over his 30 year career in development, he specialized in the integration of natural resource management and conservation in decision making processes. Gunnar's, over to you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, I, as you said, I'm trying to, I'll, you know, people might think, what's this odd man out here in the middle of all these uh, accomplished scientists and so forth. But, um, but yes, I think that if we're, as we're looking at this from a One Health perspective, we really do need to uh, bring it back to the reality of where decisions are made. And that really is a language of finance and economics. Um, the, the, I will try to uh, present that in such a way, and then perhaps for the questions answered, we can go into this a little bit more. But the COVID-19 um, uh, pandemic has thrown into sharp relief the shortcomings of the global economy and its stewardship. The conditions for the pandemic to occur in the first place were partially established 11 years ago when countries vowed to bounce back from the worst financial crisis since the Great Depression and struck a tone that suggested a readiness to, ca to recast the international order. The plan agreed in London uh, by the leaders of the G20 was bold. Uh, they wanted to restore confidence, growth, and jobs. They wanted to prepare the financial system to restart lending, strengthen financial regulation to rebuild trust, fund and reform international financial institutions to help overcome this crisis and prevent future ones, promote global trade and investment and reject protectionism, and forge an inclusive, environmentally sustainable recovery. It's very important. This did not happen, as we all know. The result was in fact a self-reinforcing cycle of weak aggregate demand, tepid growth and widening inequality. The world did not prepare for the COVID-19 pandemic as well as it could have. And the ethos that informed the response to the global financial crisis has something to do with that failure. Epidemiological and economic warning signs have flashed for years. The threat of zoonotic diseases has been growing for decades, closely linked as highlighted in the case studies to the clearing of natural habitats and their replacement with intensive livestock operations. While scientists and public health specialists have regularly warned of the potential danger, vested business interests have downplayed the health risks of deforestation and industrial farming for fear it might damage their bottom lines, while consumers, particularly in rich countries, have become addicted to cheaper meat. The financial resources needed to control the spread of zoonotic diseases now appear small change in comparison with the costs of the crisis. And the most vulnerable are again disproportionately hit. Could I have the next slide, please? In a global health crisis, putting lives before profits has triggered a series of simultaneous and mutually reinforcing supply, demand, and financial shocks. In the wake of these shocks, the global economy will contract by an estimated 4% this year, leaving global output by year's end over $6 trillion short. That's a chunk of change. The International Labor Organization estimates 500 million jobs, the majority in the global south, will be in jeopardy with 100 million possibly not returning at all. The World Bank estimates that as many as 120 I think the estimate now is 150 million people could be pushed into extreme poverty. Reversing a positive decadal trend with hunger and malnutrition following closely behind. This will certainly lead to increased morbidity and mortality. A lost decade for the global economy, or rather another lost decade, is a plausible outcome. The scenario described above is drawn from current conditions and the tendencies fortified through decades of laissez-faire policy and in particular, an unjustifiable resistance to proactive fiscal policy. But a lost decade is not inevitable. Next slide, please. 
The G20 meeting in London after the 2008 financial crisis included in its action, as I mentioned, a plan forging an inclusive, environmentally sustainable recovery. Unfortunately for the world, the profit margin motivation won. The financial sector didn't even get the equivalent of a slap on the wrist. In fact, the reforms facilitated more of the same. The pre-existing conditions of inequality, debt, and the environmental destruction were not addressed after the global financial crisis. In fact, it seems to only have gotten worse. When the pandemic broke out, the world was in a fragile and precarious situation. By late 2019, growth had slowed across all regions, and several economies were contracting in the last quarter. The financial crisis left a huge hole in public finances which has led to the implementation of many austerity measures under the assumption that reducing government spending would release resources for the private sector and thereby stimulate growth. This in turn was important in the lack of preparedness for the COVID-19 shock, especially as it relates to public health infrastructure. This dire economic outlook does not bode well for pursuing measures that are most needed. There has been for some time now recognition and a call for forging an integrative path going forward that brings together elements of ecology, biology, psychology, economics, and the analysis of values, behaviors, cultural practices, institutional structures, and societal dynamics. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Gunars. Very sobering uh, information and really highlights the importance to prevent this from happening again. Thank you. So now we're going to round out with our final uh, expert, Dr. Jamie Reeser. Dr. Reeser brings expertise in biology and psychology together to address the human dimensions of conservation and sustainable development. For the last 25 years, she has worked around the world as a senior advisor to government officials envisioning and empowering cutting edge solutions to seemingly intractable problems and raising the capacity of other science policy experts to lead highly transformative processes. It's my pleasure to welcome Jamie and over to you. Thank you, Elizabeth. So One Health provides an overarching paradigm for the integration of environmental, animal, and human health. It's a conceptual framework for collaborative, integrative efforts across multiple disciplines working from local to global scales. One Health was initially framed by the 2004 Manhattan Principles on One World, One Health. In 2019, prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, it was superseded by the Berlin Principles, which were adopted to place greater emphasis on emerging issues, including ch climate change and zoonotic disease. So if one of COVID-19's clear messages is the time to act is now, how do we act from a One Health perspective? How can the global health security agenda root more deeply in ecological systems? Greater alignment with the United Nations Convention on Biological Diversity may help. The CBD has recently developed guidance on integrating biodiversity considerations into One Health approaches and formed an interagency liaison group on biodiversity and health. The CBD and the World Health Organization have organized a series of capacity building workshops in the Americas, Africa, Europe, and Southeast Asia. Elizabeth is putting a couple of relevant, very timely documents into the chat box for you for more information on those activities. As you all know, health is a fundamental human right, and it is a key indicator of sustainable development. The Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs, call for attention to human health. In particular, Sustainable Development Goal 3 calls on stakeholders to ensure healthy lives and promote well being for all at all ages. Aspects of One Health have been included in multiple SDGs, 
For example, Sustainable Development Goal 13 on climate change and SDG 15 on life on land. However, earlier goals such as the health goal, SDG 3, do not explicitly include One Health initiatives. It's time to call for goal or an indicator that integrates One Health sectoral synergies as well as ways to measure progress. Further, I encourage human health practitioners to join in the UN Decade of Ecosystem Restoration to use this platform as an opportunity for advancing understanding of the land use induced spillover paradigm, as well as to facilitate One Health dialogues. Next slide, Elizabeth. Focusing very quickly on US policy, it's clear and also alarming that ecological health is a very clear gap in the Biden administration's pandemic prevention plan. Within USAID and other federal agencies, there's a need to establish environmental health as foundational to meeting human health goals. This includes within the existing One Health initiatives. There is also a need to build synergies across sectoral programs, to institute dedicated One Health leadership, and importantly, to foster a culture in which staff are rewarded for highly collaborative, innovative practices. Next slide. And finally, your takeaway talking points. Human health is dependent on environmental health. That is to say that the resilience and regeneration of ecological systems of all types and all geographies. Investments in biodiversity conservation and ecological restoration are investments in human health. To prevent the next pandemic, we must protect and restore nature. We must prescribe nature. Next, Elizabeth. Excellent, thank you very much, Jamie. Really pulling everything together for us. So we know that that was a lot, um, but we want to get your reflections um, before moving forward uh, with the, the Q&A. So we're going to um, jump to our Jamboard session, which I mentioned in the beginning. And I will share the link in the chat box. So you all have to join through the chat box. Sometimes um, people think that they can get access through the computer screen, but that, that won't work. So make sure that you can join in um, through the chat box. And I see some um, anonymous animals, like a little capybara. Giraffe. Don't see that many more. Um, let's give a moment for folks to join in the Jamboard. So what we're asking for here is for you to kind of reflect on what you've heard in our uh, panelists' flash talks. And as someone is jumping into it, someone probably from USAID who's very familiar with uh, Jamboard, well, what you do is you grab one of these little boxes and then you can put whatever you want into the box and it will post it into the, um, on the screen. And if you see a comment or a response that you like, you can grab one of these dots and the dots are, are kind of like a thumbs up or you second the, the idea or like it, I guess in um, you know, social media terms. So you, know, you can bring it over here and um, indicates to us that you uh, like that idea instead of having a lot of duplications. So please go ahead, just take a moment and think about it. Um, you know, we have, we can allot about um, five, five minutes or so. If we need additional uh, pages, we have several duplicates um, for folks to jot down ideas. And you can 
move to a different screen if this one is getting too crowded up at the top. Elizabeth, yeah. do you want ideas yeah. and questions here? So these are ideas of how you think we can better integrate ecosystem health into the global security, the global health security agenda. So your ideas of what we need to do. We're seeing some great ideas and several likes. People are catching on to the idea. I see we have at least over 30 people in Jamboard. So we know we're here. Lots of folks are here. Don't be shy. And like I said, you can always uh, jump to a different screen if you're feeling too crowded in this one. We'll wait a few more minutes. I still see some people, seems like they're thinking. And perhaps if you're, these concepts are really new um, to you, they, you know, the, the landscape level, ecosystem health aspects, how can we change that? what is needed to, to ensure everyone is informed and embraces uh, ecosystem health as a critical aspect of global health security. And again, just as a reminder, if you wanna to jump to the next slide, if up at the top, you see little arrows there are now eight slides. What if people have been adding some, we'll, we'll, we'll figure out all the comments, no worries. All right, let's give one more minute. Remarkably, we are right on time. So it looks like our little boxes are full. 
we can create more or you can um, move to the next slide. Yeah, oh, some people, people are already doing it. You guys are awesome. Giraffe. And same here on this slide, you know, you can bring the little dots uh, like or not. I'm dragging the box. I think everybody has the idea. Ooh, someone is uh, exploring with the other tools. There are, uh, uh, I mean, Jamboard's a little simplistic, but for this type of exercise, it works really well. Um, someone, as you can see, there are drawing tools. Okay, well, I think we, seems like we're kind of slowing down with responses. Uh, Gunars is, is very graciously offered to help uh, kind of pull the main themes together. And we will share those back with you towards the end of our session um, here in our um, kind of feedback slide. Uh, so why don't we will jump back to uh, our presentation and now it, feel free to continue jotting down thoughts um, you know, during the, the Q&A if something uh, crosses your mind, absolutely we welcome that. And now we are um, opening it up for your questions for our experts. So please use the, you know, the Zoom chat box, which I'm sure you are all uh, familiar with after a, a year of teleworking. And Jamie uh, is going to help with those, you know, moderating the, the questions and directing them to our uh, various speakers. So I will start though, just to get things um, rolling with a, kind of a, a, a general question. Um, perhaps, uh, Raina, over to you to get started. So if landscape immunity is so important, why hasn't it been addressed more in the global health sector? That's a good question. Uh, I think a, a few reasons. I think there's a lack of awareness of landscape immunity as a, a concept. I think a lack of awareness that the pandemics do start with an infected reservoir host in a population on a landscape. That's the landscape is always the context of the start. I think there are very few studies, very little data available looking at the concept of landscape immunity. For example, we know that there are infected reservoir hosts in, in a, in, in, in a, on the landscape, yet there are very few studies that track the infections in wild animals in space and time leading to that understanding of when we see surges of infection and troughs of infection and those surges of infection are often the conditions that allow those spillover events that lead to outbreaks uh, or pandemics so we need more concentration of research effort on in situ on the landscape to really understand how these pathogens are circulating. And then of course, how are the pathogens in the hosts responding to the rapid environmental changes that are happening across the globe? If we don't have the baseline data on the wildlife hosts and the, and the pathogen dynamics, then it's hard then to assess how these environmental changes are driving those hosts and pathogens into situations where we get spillover and pandemics. Elizabeth, if I can just quickly add my physician perspective, you know, health, of course, is well beyond the healthcare system and multi sectoral approaches are necessary. The one health approach is a great, uh, a great thing as far as looking at those interlinkages between animals and wildlife, humans and, and the environment, but it doesn't go far enough. And just like 
um, energy policy, food systems policy, these are health policies. We are, are simply not having a broad enough view and we have a blind spot when we think about really going to the earliest events and, and that when we destroy natural habitats that have an ecosystem service of maintaining a balance so the pathogens don't go out of balance, uh, it's just, uh, we're not going far enough uh, in our view of what true prevention is. Great, thank you. Anyone else want to add to that? Okay, Jamie, are you ready with a, um, a, a question from the audience? Sure, there are quite a few coming in here. So I'm gonna throw this out uh, to the entire team and see um, what comments folks would like to bring forward on the topic of infrastructure development. So what can be done to address infrastructure development such that it reduces the risk of zoonotic pathogen transmission? Anyone wanna step in with that one? I'll start with some just some broad concepts. So going back to the infect, shed, spread, <laughs> infect, um, sp spill, spread, the cascade. Uh, if you think about the pandemic, there needs to be this contact between the infected reservoir host and the immediate host, often livestock, domestic species, or farmed wild animals, or directly to humans. And anything that brings uh, humans were into contact with with nature with wildlife is going to increase the opportunities for those spillover events that trigger pandemics so road building would be an example every time we build roads we bring people into places uh, we, we intrude in natural environments we allow more extraction of animals out of those environments we create edges to when we fragment natural areas we're creating edges which are contact zones between people and nature. So if we're thinking about trying to have intact large nature as much as is possible by decreasing fragmentation and decreasing the crisscrossing of roads through natural areas would be a good start. So I'll take that from the policy framework. If you follow the 30 by 30 initiatives, um, the goal set that Raina just spoke to is inherent within that policy context. Other comments on infrastructure? I'll jump in, because we've thought a lot about this in the context of rivers and, and waterborne disease. Um, and, um, you know, of course, we're going to always need more infrastructure. It's kind of, you know, part and parcel to human survival, really. And, um, and yet, um, you know, we looked into, for example, restoring prawn and other uh, aquatic animal migrations up and down rivers through prawn ladders or fish ladders in dams. And they turn out to be a very small fraction of the overall cost. And they're even more inexpensive if you, if you work their um, design in from the beginning rather than having to retrofit after the fact. And it's really been about gosh, 70 years that the World Health Organization has been calling for uh, more attention paid to these waterborne diseases that are part of the repercussions of these large dam projects. And yet it seems like um, somehow we continue to build a lot of these large dams without these very small um, additional factors that would restore or maintain some of the aquatic biodiversity that's really giving us a service, a, a service for health um, by reducing, potentially reducing some of these um, invertebrate species that are carrying parasites that then then emerge after after the um, water infrastructure projects. So some simple solutions, I think. Um, aquaculture, small scale aquaculture is also on the rise. And if we use it well, we might be able to reintroduce certain species, um, uh, including native species and the native prawns I was speaking about um, in targeted areas to help, again, restore that ecosystem service to reduce health. So I think there are ways to do infrastructure um, with some of this, this information in mind. Great, thank you, Sana. So there are a couple of questions in here regarding surveillance. So I'm gonna ask um, you, Raina, to start with this one. 
So the question is, how can we strengthen surveillance systems for zoonotic disease? And I think it would be interesting to, to both speak to that as well as the importance of the preventative action since surveillance tells us what's there, but doesn't necessarily give us the intervention potential in and of itself. Yeah, it's, it's a complex question. We can't obviously surveil every species and every pathogen across the globe. So we've got to have some kind of risk assessment. Where do we start? So we should be starting with the high risk species that are reservoir hosts, so bats, rodents, birds. We should be looking at coronaviruses, filoviruses, hendipaviruses, influenza viruses, others that we know have the potential for cross-species transmission and, and, and maybe even transmission among humans. Uh, we we need to so we need to hone in on the right species. We should be honing in on the the landscapes where these transmission events are most likely. And these are landscapes where we're seeing rapid environmental change, high human population density, high livestock density, many opportunities for human wildlife interactions, uh, especially particularly with wildlife trade in, in many countries right now. So then we need to think also about pathogens uh, in their hosts in relation to the environmental changes that are happening. And as I said before, we need the data on the pathogens in the host in space and time. So that needs a lot of replication. You need to be very large scale, very well-funded studies with a lot of metadata collected on things like the land use changes happening, the climatic changes happening, uh, the health of the wildlife species, their immune systems, their interaction with the pathogen and the, the landscape. So we need this transdisciplinary approach. I mean, essentially this is one health, but this needs to be well-funded. It needs to be scaled. It needs to be done in high biodiverse hotspot areas around the world. Abby, do you wanna to add to that? Um, yeah, just very quickly, I mean, of course, uh, fully agree with everything Rana just said. Um, also wanted to quickly add that, um, you know, some of the, some of the most, as I mentioned earlier in my, in, in my flash talk, uh, some of the most vulnerable communities are actually those who've had a very long history of living in some of these biodiverse systems. And, um, and so it's, it's also important not to ignore um, some of the knowledge that's, that, that's associated with, um, with, with the people have of these systems and of these diseases. Um, sort of just also trying to link back to, to the previous infrastructure question. We know that uh, when infrastructure uh, projects come in, often the benefits of those are far away, but the impacts are felt very locally uh, uh, to these vulnerable communities. And that's, that's why as the world becomes more, um, more urbanized as well as globalized, uh, the, the sort of catchment area of, of cities increases and um, their impacts increase. So, you know, both from a surveillance and a health systems point of view, as well as from a uh, an impact mitigation uh, perspective, it's important to to look at effects locally as well because those are often the weakest links in these transmission cycles. So people who are who are sort of at the front line, um, uh, they are likely to be the most vulnerable, and then that's going to spill over to different parts of, of the population. And then once it comes to a city or something, then it can easily go global, go global as happened with, with COVID. Um, so that's, that's, that's what I wanted to say about that. Any other comments on surveillance? Thank you, Abby. Go ahead, Jonathan. Uh, yeah, I'll just say that I think it's really important that we're not talking about uh, either or. Either we do uh, more surveillance or more ecosystem modeling. I think absolutely we always need uh, early, good early surveillance to detect the first cases and prevent them from spreading. But here we have an opportunity to invest where we have not been investing in, which is to go earlier than that and look at these ecosystem disruptions. Uh, because we have 
there are, not, there are several studies uh, over the last few decades that really point to habitat destruction, fragmentation, as Raina is talking about, and the effect of disease emergence. Uh, we need to monopolize on those studies, but we have a lot more we lead, need to learn about. And I think this is where uh, you know, we really want to prevent the very first human case. And this is where we're not investing enough to go into the more ecosystem modeling uh, that, that present those risks before the first uh, early detected case happens. I think that's a really a key point is what we've been talking about really these upstream factors that are happening on the natural landscape. How can we arrest the infect, uh, spill, spread, cascade before it actually starts, before it becomes a pandemic. But I think Jonathan raised a really important point that I don't want to miss here. And that is that we're not always going to pick these up within wildlife and we're not going to always be able to stop those processes on the landscape that lead to the pandemic. And so catching those first cases in humans is absolutely key. So we've got to have that really strong surveillance systems based around this, again, the high risk interfaces where people have a lot of contact with animals that are likely to be reservoirs and then catching the spread at the early stages before it becomes a pandemic. Thank you all. So a number of participants have recognized one of the Achilles heels uh, in this entire discussion, which is the data challenge. Uh, getting the data, mobilizing the data, building the data into interoperable platforms that draw across health environment and agricultural sectors. Um, and then in addition to getting the data there, um, mobilizing the data into various applications, artificial intelligence tools, and so forth. So the interest is uh, what, what is being done in this regard um, and what could be more effectively done in, in this regard. Um, does anybody wanna to speak to that? I'm help, happy to respond to this one, but I wanna check first to see if there are any other panelists who'd like to speak to this issue, particularly Gunnar's in terms of the challenges of moving uh, socioeconomic data into um, interfaces with biological data. That's been an ongoing challenge for all sorts of information applications. Are you with us, Gunnars? You have to take it off mute. There you go. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, I know for sure. I think that um, from a, a, socio, uh, a social uh, sciences perspective, uh, and trying to do that interface with the um, natural resources, uh, that has always been our challenge. So when we were doing, um, when we are doing uh, modeling and trying to get the, the every time a little bit more complicated by adding different layers, as if you were like GIS layers or what have you, um, being able to accumulate and to get that data uh, onto, um, just to get the, the resources that you need to be able to do that. And then also just being able to process that data um, has been a significant challenge in all the work that we have been doing. And if you, you imagine just looking at a simple watershed um, and all of the plethora of different uh, interactions that happen at that little microcosm, um, it is a very difficult thing as I'm sure most of my colleagues here are going to attest. Um, and the, however, on the flip side of that, uh, what I have seen and what we are seeing is that we have now more and more the capacity and the capability to process big um, data. Uh, and that, uh, and the, this capacity and the tools that are out there are facilitating and making it easier and easier for us to be able to do that. I think that part of the resistance that you have at the a social science perspective is that um, it gets more complicated and then people are just like, you know, it's that old joke about economists. Oh, we don't know how to do that. Oh, it must be an externality. And so it jumps out, right? Um, but nowadays, we don't have that excuse. I mean, we are able to provide and we are able to collect that more and more. However, um, again, we need the resources. And as I was mentioning in my, my talk, um, those resources have to be present and we need to be, uh, make that a priority as some of, this, as some of these um, on the Jamboard came through. Uh, we do need to have the resource to do that. We need to have the um, decision makers sensitized to the fact that this is absolutely important if we want to have this um, safe uh, future environment that we want. 
And Carl, do you want to speak to that at all from the experiences that I see has had in trying to bring, you know, biodiversity and um, social data together for decision making in the island context? Um, yeah, thanks, Jamie. Um, yeah, so we've been working on a couple of different databases that look to sort of really pull together, you know, uh, data in, in slightly different space. Um, mainly around biodiversity aspects and also, you know, um, er eradications and uh, of invasive species. And it, um, it's super interesting out of some of that, that you sort of see that invasive species, although they have such a wide, uh, wide ranging sort of impacts, you know, really on people and the environment, you know, what we've sort of seen within that is that invasive mammals, uh, at, at least, has been a, you know, tool that's been, developed and essentially employed just for biodiversity conservation. Um, and I think, yeah, within this, um, so flipping this back around, yeah, there's an opportunity to take it to scale um, and, yeah, really deploy those tools that are being developed in this specific sector, um, you know, deploy them in a, in a broader context um, that, that we're seeing here to secure a broader suite of benefits than um, what are currently being realised um, just for biodiversity conservation. Great. So a couple of comments to bring this into the, the US federal context. I just put in the chat box for you all an uh, article that was in a special issue of biological invasions this last year, which focuses on building a federal information infrastructure for invasive species. The zoonotic pathogen issue, as, as Carl pointed out in his presentation, is a subset of the invasive species issue. So that will answer some of the, the questions that you all are interested in. There are also some uh, related articles in that special issue. I think this is a terrific area for the US government, One Health interested staff to work on. Um, there's a tremendous amount of fragmentation within the information infrastructure within the United States. We have bison, the biodiversity information serving our nation database as, as our national occurrence database, but a lot of other relevant databases that could be feeding into that across the health and agriculture uh, and, and broader environmental sectors are not interoperable with that information system. So it's impossible to, to pull uh, even the existing resources uh, together and then comprehensively evaluate them with with various uh, tool sets and, and modeling applications. So calling for the interoperability um, and tooling of the information structure we already have would certainly advance our capacities in the, in the US context. I will also draw your attention to the fact that there was funding within the recent COVID relief package to build information infrastructure related to zoonotic pathogens. Uh, so keep an eye um, on the evolution of, of that work, which I think will largely go to interior um, agriculture and um, possibly some with HHS as well. So doing a time check, Elizabeth, do we want to do one more question or go over to uh, the Jamboard summary? Yeah, I think probably a good idea to go over to the Jamboard. Um, and then we will leave time to make sure we have time for uh, kind of our take home messages. Perfect. All right. Thank you. No, thank you. Outstanding uh, discussion. And really, you're, you're capturing the, the main kind of challenges that we face. Um, but I, I did want to pull us back to uh, the Jamboard to see uh, what folks uh, we're, we're saying, and you're certainly welcome to uh, go through and see all the comments, but to kind of um, show some highlights. So there were a couple of messages um, about the private sector, uh, you know, uh, public private partnerships and, and engaging them uh, with a solution, which is uh, uh, certainly um, really critical and, and necessary. Uh, we can't do development alone, as we all know. So, and, but just as, as part of that, 
including ecosystem health as a requirement for those, um, you know, either partnerships or uh, any type of funding requirement. And certainly there, there are, um, you know, in, environmental safeguards that are uh, required for uh, particularly like USAID projects, but including a specific angle that focuses on the health aspects um, was mentioned. And next, so increase buy-in from world leaders and mention of the ecosystem health at G7 and G20. So really kind of building in uh, ecosystem health as part of the One Health messaging at, at really high levels. Uh, and then next is increase incentives for supporting integrated One Health projects that include uh, ecosystem health. There's strong recognition that we need more kind of integrated uh, thinking. And then lastly, um, collaborate to use the best available disease ecology and landscape ecology and socioeconomic data in robust uh, predictive modeling. So this, I, I took a, a little liberty to kind of flesh out the, the concept, um, but, you know, as the conversation has noted, there, there are some data uh, deficiencies, but we can use the best available data that, that we have and use the different data sources to try to um, create these uh, predictive models and then actually go out and um, test them. So Gunars, did you have anything else to, um, to add to this? No, I think I'm, I'm, thank you for doing that. I think you did my job. I mean, it's like, uh, you just, <laughs> I didn't you just, see you, uh, so I was like, oh dear. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I, it's my first time I'm using Jamboard, so apologies for that. No, um, right. But um, the, I think you captured it well. Yeah, I think that, uh, I mean, I, I went, I ordered it by the number of bullets that uh, different things had, had and um, you, you hit those. I mean, creating incentives was an important aspect. Uh, ensuring you know, ecosystem health and the value to human health is appropriately valued. Um, so again, the value thing. So I think there were two clusters of uh, valuing um, of uh, policy, of getting it to policy and to the decision maker. So it's like uh, get on the tables um, and also the whole aspect of measuring and um, how do we uh, recognize that uh, one, that health is um, part of uh, the decision making. Um, I think those were the sort of like the big general gists. Anyone else? No, I, I think that's great. Thank you. Um, so now let me just oops, um, jump back to our presentation. And we're just going to hear from uh, our, we want to end with kind of key messages, take home messages to, to wrap up in our last five minutes or so. So we're, we're um, going to, to just kind of go through our, uh, our speakers, our, our experts, and, uh, and then uh, wrap us up. So let's start with Jonathan. Uh, what message do you have for our, our participants to remember? You know, the, the key message that I have is that um, environmental conditions are so extremely important to many health outcomes. And uh, it's, we have been ignoring, we've been benefiting as far as our health by uh, taking natural resources and using them for increasing our longevity and our population and our health, but we are now um, overexploiting natural resources at our own peril. And um, if not now, I don't know when, we need to really look at these factors and take them seriously and recognize the, the dependence that our health 
uh, has on the natural world. Excellent, thank you, Jonathan. Raina, over to you. I'm gonna repeat that pandemics start with an infected animal on a landscape. And the most common factor that we understand drives the infection from those animals on the landscape into human communities, triggering outbreaks and pandemics is land use change. Yet we have very little understanding and knowledge of how this process happens. So we need to develop this knowledge base about how land use triggers this cascade that leads to the pandemic. So then we can manage landscapes to prevent the pandemics from happening in the first place. Excellent, thank you, Raina. Sana, over to you. Thanks, yeah. So I just, I wanna say that I wanna instill a little bit of hope and say that, um, you know, as an ecologist and, and veterinarian myself, um, I've been studying these systems and I, and I think we can turn the drivers of disease information into solutions, into ecological solutions to promote health, sort of like the, the prawn introductions that we've discovered. Um, and in fact, we have a whole working group working on that. Um, and we'll be presenting on Friday in this conference at uh, 1030 Eastern, I think. Uh, we have 45 other examples besides the prawns of uh, ways to turn these environmental drivers into ecological solutions. So come and think more about that with us. Excellent, Sana, um, love the, the positive comment and the plug. Absolutely, I'll put that actually in the um, chat box. Carl, over to you. Thanks, Elizabeth. Um, yeah, from, from the corner where I'm sort of sitting, if you will, um, I mean, essentially we've, we've been We've been working on removing, um, if you will, some of you know some of the species that uh, are key to this, invasive rodents uh, being one of them. Um, but we've been doing this essentially, you know, within a a, a niche kind of uh, a field, you know, within biodiversity, um, eradicating uh, invasive species on islands, and particularly invasive mammals. Yeah, you know, and we're getting really good at it. Um, we're developing also a suite of new tools um, around this, and you know that. What we're really driven on getting is these permanent sustainable outcomes, you know, through er eradicating uh, it, the invasive mammals. Um, and so just encourage, you know, the people have to think about maybe we can take that to scale and broaden it from just having biodiversity benefits, um, utilizing skill sets uh, such as you know, mine and my team. And there's a suite of other people around um, with very similar bits that could be applied to this field as well. Excellent, thank you, Carl. Abby, over to you. Um, thanks, Elizabeth. Um, I, I, think it's, I, I think a simple mes message for me, although it's not simple, it's complex, is, because, is that the dynamics of these systems are complex. Um, disease uh, emergence patterns, their interactions with, with humans, with, uh, with livestock, with animals, uh, is, is complex and there are no silver bullet solutions to this. So the solutions are also multifaceted. And in many places across the world, we have to keep in mind that um, simplistic solutions will might have negative effects on the livelihoods of people who, who are vulnerable and who are directly uh, in the line of fire. So, so these trade-offs have to be balanced somehow. Um, that's my basic take home. Thanks. Thank you, Abhi. Gunars? Um, you know, I want to I uh, echo what uh, Jamie said a while ago, and I think Jonathan as well, um, that it's for us to recognize that a healthy environment is really a necessary condition uh, for a healthy society. And um, I think that what we need to do is we need to find the instruments, the policy, the regulatory, the financial instruments that motivate decision makers to move in the direction of an integrated approach, of a one health approach. You know, we need something that looks at the bigger picture, you know, um, one that looks at society as a whole and not only at the profit margin. Excellent. And Jamie, end us out. Thank you. So for me, this all comes down to the need to reanimate our relationship with nature to see humans as a part of rather than apart from living systems. 
So I'm gonna end with an invitation for you to go out today and hug a tree, to hug a tree in gratitude for every breath that you take and to find a way to make Earth Day a way of life. Outstanding, Jamie, thank you. Being a tree hugger myself, I, I want to uh, end by thanking all of our amazing panelists, thank you. Um, and you know, thanks the, the audience for the really great participation and your dedication to global health. Uh, I hope that this has motivated you to, to reach out and collaborate with ecosystem health experts and, and help mitigate um, land-induced zoonotic spillover. Because I, I really think working holistically, we can uh, develop long-lasting uh, sustainable solutions. So many thanks, uh, everybody. I realize we're two minutes over, um, but I hope many of you have stuck around to the end and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you.